Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Carl DeSalvo. I'm trying to find your bio here. Um, he's come here from Georgia Tech. He holds a PhD in design from Carnegie Mellon University, but he's someone who combines design, humanities, and science and technology studies, as Masha said, the interdisciplinary field where she and I are most uh, deeply rooted. Um, and you do so in really interesting ways, I think, um, ways that uh, ask, I think, socially and quite politically engaged questions, such as how might design practice be used to foster civic engagement? Um, like me and, and like Masha and like others in the room, um, Dr. Zasalvo has an interest in design and innovation um, in, rural, in rural spaces, sorry. Um, and so I, my sense is that you straddle kind of technology and areas kind of both scholarly and popularly considered folksy, maybe, or parochial. <laughs> Not, not that I consider them that, but I think um, that that might be so. And so I think you push boundaries in that way. Um, Dr. DeSalvo publishes regularly in design in STS and in human computer interaction journals. And he has two books, one adversarial design um, from MIT Press in 2012, and a new book, which is actually out on the table for viewing outside for those of us here in person called Design as Democratic Inquiry from this year. So without further ado, Carl. Okay, is this working? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, go back to the slides, like to the first slide. So somewhere, that's fine. There's definitely gonna be hiccups today. Um, I think that's one of the last slides. That may be the last slide. Can you set it to play from start? Anyway, those are all the people that I'm gonna thank at the end. <laughs> um, I sometimes do begin with that. So, um, I can go up there. Um, so I'm going to wait for this obviously to get started. Um, yeah, there's definitely going to be hiccups as I was telling folks this morning. This is the first time I've traveled to give a talk um, in two years. Um, it's been long enough that actually, as I was getting ready to leave, um, I realized that my passport was about to expire. So in fact, it expires at the end of this month. So um, it's been that long um, and that's how close it's been. Um, so do you want me to go upstairs and give a hand? Yep, those are the slides now. You can go to the first, the first one. Nope. Yep. Go to the beginning. Yep. There we go. Perfect. Okay. There we go. Um, now let's test. That's correct. And, but how do I click it? Uh, hmm. but not it? The green button is not advancing it. It is not smart. So I think, um... What's that? Mm -hmm. Now it's working. Oh, I probably don't need to yell, do I? Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. I'm going to share some um, work from my new book, Design as Democratic Inquiry, um, which you'll see um, it does engage um, aspects of agriculture, um, in a sense, in that book. 
Um, I'm going to talk particularly, uh, though, about um, urban settings today, um, which actually, in a way, are quite folksy. I like that word. Um, and I want to recognize, um, in terms of uh, a land acknowledgement, that the work you're going to see today was all done in Atlanta. Um, and Atlanta is the unceded land of the Muskegee Creek people who were forcibly removed from that area in the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So my work asks a basic question, which is, how do we think and do, do design otherwise? And in asking this question, what I'm interested in um, is recognizing that design offers us a certain set of techniques and methods and perspectives that are useful um, for marshalling creative responses to issues in the world. And at the same time, there are limitations with the ways in which um, design as a field and as a practice continues to operate. So I'm not the only one to think about that. There's many others who are thinking about that. And um, this work is very much in conversation with them with the idea that together we might try to advance a different understanding of um, what it is that we might be doing with design. And in particular, the question I'm interested in, the approach I'm interested in is this, how do we understand design as a way of participating in and contributing to democracy? So this is a question that many people actually are asking um, within the field of design studies and within related fields. It's long been a question, I think also within science and technology studies. But one of the challenges that we have specifically within design um, Can you advance the slide? I don't know what just happened. But one of the challenges that we have within the field of design is that historically design is born of industry. Right? And so the historian Clive Gilnott calls this out and says one of the challenges in thinking about the ways in which design can participate and contribute to social conditions is the fact that we as a field are, were brought forth out of industrial requirements um, and the Industrial Revolution as a way of creating products and later services that were somehow distinctive. Right? And fundamentally, one of the challenges that we face is that the commitments of design are actually, or rather the commitments of the professional design are not actually the same as the commitments um, of democracy. And so Lily Arani talks about this in great length and um, quite um, movingly when she talks about the ways in which even when designers are working to do projects that aim to have some sort of social good in them, because of the ways in which we end up doing design, we actually are foreclosing, as she says, um, the slow work of democracy across different, right? Even when design attempts to contribute to democracy, it often ends up thwarting it. What this leads me to is the claim that we need different narratives and theories of design. At the end of the day, if we want design to participate and contribute in democracy, we need to find other ways to describe and talk about it. And that's primarily what I'm interested in, sort of with others beginning to develop those different ways of um, theorizing and different stories to tell. So this is a big word, and I think it's a word that we should spend a couple minutes asking questions about because folks often say, what are you talking about? When you say contributing to democracy, aren't we seeing the end of democracy? Is democracy really an inherent good? What in fact are we talking about? And to me, the question about what democracy is, is actually so important for us to engage um, as part of this project. So to be clear, when I talk about democracy, I'm not talking about um, these sorts of settings. Right? I fully recognize that we need structures, whether it's Congress or parliament or other structures, of formal organizational decision-making, but that's actually not what I'm talking about. I'm also not talking about individual mechanisms that often happen in democracy. So I used to be one of those people that like to um, quip if, if voting changed anything, they make it illegal. Um, I've lived in the South um, for 15 years now, and I realized that voting does change things. And in fact, they are constantly trying to make it illegal. Um, so voting is real, right? But again, this is not actually what my um, focus has been on when I'm thinking about the contributions of design to democracy. Really what I'm interested in is this idea of democracy as a lived and communal experience. So one of the foundations for this perspective is the work of American pragmatists and folks often invoke John Dewey at this moment, which makes sense because Dewey talks about the idea of democracy as a 
um, uh, a mode of associated living and talks about the idea of democracy itself as an experimental practice of social change. But other theorists, like particularly Daniela Rosner, have pointed out the shortcomings when we always return to Dewey because Dewey has some um, problems with some of the theories. And in fact, we should broaden the ways in which we look at that. And so I've been drawn to sort of two other touch points for thinking about democracy. One sticks with the work of pragmatism and is really grounded in Jane uh, Adams' work. I almost said Jane Austen, it's not the same thing. Um, Jane Adams' work in the Hull House in Chicago in the uh, early 1900s. So Jane Adams was a reformer who helped put together what is the Hull House, which was a house that brought in immigrants and poor working people in Chicago, and they learned trade. And then one of the important things to recognize is that many of those trades were in fact trades around making. So they learned all manner of making as a way of participating in a kind of local democracy, including participating in research. The work of Jane Addams and together with Hull House residents contributed to very early community-based mapping efforts that went on to form the US census, doing some of the first collections of data in Chicago of these immigrant and poor working communities. Another important touch point for me comes in the work of social movements and here in particular social movements like Occupy Sandy. So Occupy Sandy grew out of the Occupy movement and was a response to Hurricane Sandy that really brought together in a sophisticated way, a collection of resources from the state, from mutual aid and from nonprofits. One of the things that stands out about Occupy Sandy as a touch point is the role of design. So designers participated in Occupy Sandy, creating everyday sorts of things such as signage, right, that worked as a kind of way of materializing these prefigurative politics um, in that moment. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about democracy, these kinds of what I go on to call design experiments and civics, right? So, this is somewhat of an awkward term. I'll be the first to admit that, but I think it's an important term when these three words sort of come to play together. And it's what I'm gonna describe in more detail um, today. So when I talk about design experiments and civics, right, what I'm talking about is a series of practices that first of all involve making. Right? They're design experiments because they involve particular kinds of making. They're experiments because they involve inquiry. And this is not a call for a kind of scientific design practice or design science, but rather to recognize that we have inquiry across all fields. Right? Obviously, probably to everyone here, we have inquiry within the arts. Right? So we're looking at them as a kind of activity that's not oriented towards products and services, but is oriented towards um, inquiry. And then their civics, I use the word civics here as shorthand for a kind of democracy, a local democracy, right? A democracy in the small. For me, working at this scale is important because it's where I want to work as a scholar, right? So this isn't to dismiss larger discussions about democracy at the global level or at the national level, but as a researcher, right? as an engaged scholar, what moves me is the kind of intimacies that happen in local democracies, right? Where I'm working together with people who I will see who we share a city together with. Okay, so what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna share one of these design experiments in civics that I talk about in the book. And I'm going to tell you about this project and I'm gonna call attention to some of the ways in which approaching the kind of work, this kind of work calls into question the character of our work as designers the qualities of the things that we make and how they function in this kind of an experimental practice, and then how this turns us to a notion of care. The project I'm gonna talk about today is a project called Careful Coding, which is a project that's been going on for about seven or eight years now, and is still going on today. So this project is set within the context of the smart city, Atlanta, like, many, every city around the globe, um, or many cities at least, in the mid, about 2015, decided it wanted to become a smart city. And so it posed this question, right, what is a smart ATL? And it began to try to answer this question through various practices in city government. There was a new office 
um, that was created for information management. Um, we became one of Rockefeller resilient cities, right? There was a number of ways in which um, folks in City Hall attempted to answer this question, what would be a smart ATL? One of the ways in which they answered this question that was interesting to me was to look at things outside of Atlanta, right? So this is the design for an array of things, which was a sensor network that was developed um, and um, sort of distributed through the Metro Lab network. And the idea here was to have a common sensor network that you could put in cities across the United States, right? And use it to collect data. And in this way, we could make smart cities. What really struck me about this was that in fact, the, this, this initiative and many of these other initiatives had absolutely nothing to do with Atlanta. In fact, their entire approach was to say, how do we create a generic notion of a smart city and put it in Atlanta and then put it in Chattanooga and then put it in Ithaca and then put it in uh, Akron and so on. What I was much more interested in is understanding what does a smart city look like from the perspective of the residents of the city of Atlanta right, and from their histories. And when we begin to think about the residents and the histories of the city of Atlanta, it's important to recognize that Atlanta is one of the homes of the civil rights movement in the United States. Right? It is a place where many civil rights leaders lived in the 1960s right? and continue to live today. So it is not at all uncommon. I guess it's getting a little less common now that um, folks, we all get older, but it, it's not entirely uncommon to go to a community meeting and to actually have people at that community meeting who, for example, marched alongside Dr. King. So this is the context of what it means to do civic work in Atlanta, is to do it within a history and an ongoing tradition of peoples who are trying to self-determine their local democracies through direct action. And the question I was interested in is, what does a smart city, what does a smart Atlanta look like when we ground it in this perspective and this set of contexts? So for the past seven or eight years, um, we've been working with an organization in Atlanta called Block by Block. Um, this is my friend and partner, Les, who, um, or project partner, Les, who started um, Block by Block. I love these pictures of Les because this shows um, him in the way that I first met him in the way that he still is to this day, where you go into Les's neighborhood and he is constantly standing there or biking around or moving through the neighborhood pointing at things, right? And he's showing us the things in his neighborhood that he wants to change. And he's showing us the things in his neighborhood that he's proud of, right? And he's showing the things in his neighborhood that he wants to keep stable, right? And he's engaged and he's present and he's there. And he started this organization block by block to bring together residents from this neighborhood to address the issues that they were facing on a daily basis, one block at a time. And what they're facing is gentrification, right? This is an image that's taken from within the neighborhood Les lives, right? And it's a neighborhood that, well, if we look closely, we can sort of see what's happening. It's a neighborhood that is, um, has been around for a while, right? We have early 1900s housing there um, that is still amazing housing, right? In a, in a working class neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that abuts downtown. It's a neighborhood that abuts the site of the new stadium, which at night um, in a somewhat ironic way, glows green and casts a green shadow of the um, Mercedes symbols into the neighborhood. It's also a neighborhood that if you look on the edge there, you can see is a neighborhood that's undergoing gentrification. So what we have there is a house that's in the process of being built that's wrapped in Tyvek with the porta potty for the workers out front. What Les is concerned about, what I'm gonna talk about in some depth today are code violations. So this gets us into the nitty gritty of how cities work or at least how Atlanta works. This is a picture from the city of Atlanta code violation website. Code violations are like traffic infractions, but against the built environment. So they are things that are deemed to be unsafe in the built environment. 
And this includes things like collapsed roofs, right, or houses that are infested with mold or mildew. It includes things like um, empty lots or lots in which there's dumping. It includes things like rat infestation. Code violations are important and relevant to block by block as an organization because code violations are often a marker of absentee or delinquent or predatory landlords. Because what happens is people come in and they buy properties, right? And then they literally let the properties rot while they wait for housing prices or property prices to rise. Code violations can be acted against, right? So if a code violation is cited, the owner of that property has to go to city hall in order to address that violation. Keeping track of code violations then is one way that block by block can try to intercede in the gentrification that's happening in their neighborhood. So what we've done with block by block and its volunteers over the past many years is work with them to design a series of tools and techniques and data sets that enable them to collect code violations in a way that can leverage that for responses from the city. So for example, here you see one of the volunteers collecting vo uh, violations on a building that's a new building, but has been boarded up and left empty for more than six months. Code violations being collected about an empty lot. So empty lots are a problem because a house once existed here that people could live in. It's been raised by a developer and then left to stay empty. That lot will then soon become a site for dumping. And we explored different ways of collecting these code violations. So we explored ways of collecting them using sort of tablets and these and phones using off the shelf self software. We explored using low fidelity techniques such as paper forms that could be put into binders and you could walk around the neighborhood and collect this information on sheets of paper. We explored hybrid ways of engaging with residents. So what you see here is a larger paper map it has a sheet of acetate on it that we would take out and ask residents, for example, in this case, to point out rat infestations. They would point out that information with little post-it notes, which we could then take back and turn into actual data points or combined um, analog digital methods. So paper-based maps that are often needed so that we actually know the address that we're looking at together with a digital um, tool to collect that data. <laughs> We began then putting that data into kinds of representational forms that would make sense to the city. So for example, collecting that data and putting it on maps that could be searched or that would show that information. We also explored other kinds of data collection techniques. So for those of you who haven't ever lived in the South, um, this is what happens if you don't take care of your yard for about three years. Um, and on the one hand, it's beautiful, right? But the problem is, is that there's a completely livable house behind there that's been made almost unlivable because the property manager has not taken care of it. And so we began exploring not only how can we collect data points, but how can we use media representations as a way of collecting information about code violations through photographs and then creating tools like this that allowed um, residents to browse the photographs and to share the photographs back with the city as a way of marking code violations in the neighborhood. And over time, what we did is we collected massive amounts of data and we explored different ways to organize that data and different things that we could join that data together with in order to have effect. One of the things that we ended up producing that was useful that ended up allowing us to take action or request action were data sets that showed what the residents had collected versus what the city had collected, what was in common and what was different. And after producing a robust enough data set, Block by block together with us took this to City Hall and we said, look, we have this data of things that are happening in the city and we would like you to do something. And much to everyone's surprise, something actually happened. Okay. So what happened though is where we get to some of the ways in which I think we have to shift how we talk about this within design um, and what actually is the work that we're engaged in. So we began with this situation where we had block by block a group of community residents who wanted to exert um, influence on the city, who actually wanted to make what we would call a contestational political claim, right? They wanted to garner resources from the city that would cost the city, right? They wanted to have these issues taken care of. 
And what became apparent is that how they went about this mattered. So we started off and data became the field for this action, right? It became the medium that sparked the initial kinds of engagements. And then over time though, what became important was recognizing how the particulars of the tools and the processes and the data and the media mattered for particular kinds of responses, right? So for example, we experimented with using these tablet-based tools that allowed us to collect photographs. The photographs were a kind of evidence of certain kinds of code violations, right? in particular overgrowth, that actually could go to very specific institutions within city government, such as Atlanta 311, that had a mechanism for accepting photographs as evidence in order to act on it. Or we went and collected information about rat infestations in the street using this kind of direct action sort of approach. And then we translated that into spreadsheet data, which we were then able to give to the Department of Public Works because they could not accept maps or photographs, but they can accept spreadsheet data in order to initiate action. In this context, Making and using enabled us to explore different pathways around and between institutions. Right? The experiment is this exploration of pathways. Right? This is an example of what Hubrix and all call institutioning. Right? This idea of engaging in practices that are about weaving in between, creating new insides and outsides of existing institutions so that we can affect civic action in very particular ways. This movement in between these institutions then really is about experimenting with different configurations of authority and agency. Those experimentations with different configurations of authority and agency are made possible through that making and using. When block by block collects photographic data, it is able to take that photographic data into a very particular context with the 311 services and use it to exert, to assert themselves, right? In order to request that, the, that that overgrowth is comes out and is cut down and that the owner is cited. That changes their status as an organization. That changes the status of the residents. They go from being simply an annoying resident who happens to call 311 all the time to suddenly an organization that has what is seen to be legitimate data. Similarly, with the rat infestation data, they go from being someone who simply calls the Department of Public Works and complains about rat infestations to in fact being the organization that not only has data, but has the data that is most expert, that is most up to the minute. If we step back and think about this from the perspective of design criticism or many of us who are makers, one thing I wanna point out is this calls into question how we tend to judge the activities and outcomes of making, right? How we tend to judge the things that are made. When we make a map like this, or we make the data sets that undergird this map, it turns out that what's not at all important is the particulars of this representation in terms of what colors are those dots, right? Or what actual um, information is in that data, right? What is important is what it enables us to do, right? And this shifts us and it makes us realize that when we are talking about these design experiments in civics, it's important to recognize that the object is not actually the subject of the experiment, right? The thing that we have made is not actually the thing that we are inquiring about. The thing that we have made is a tool that enables us to get to the thing that we've inquiring about. In this case, to get to that idea of how we might differently configure authority and agency. The work of the design experiment then is yes, to use making as a process, but to use it as a process where its goal is to create the condition for inquiry. Before block by block had these tools, before block by block had this data set, right? They could go down one pathway, right? With the tools, with the data set, with the processes they developed and maintained, they could now inquire into a different set of relations with the city. Right? This is the work of the design experiment is to create those conditions for 
inquiry ultimately for a combination of contestation and imagination. As we're doing that, one of the things that's crucial to recognize, and that again, challenges some of our assumptions about design practice, is that we're part of those conditions. Right? We're not neutral or outside of the design experiment. Sometimes this happened in a way in which we are responsible for the data that was collected. Right? So this is a picture, I'm the one taking the picture. Um, that's Les, um, the director of Block by Block and my colleague, Dr. Amanda Ming. We're actually out in the neighborhood collecting this data. This data matters, right? When we go and collect this data and we say there's a code violation there and the city of Atlanta comes out and inspects the data, if in fact there is a code violation there, a sticker is put on the house, right? And the house is deemed uninhabitable until that code violation is remedied. When we are collecting this data, the activities that we are participating in have real and direct and nearly immediate material consequences. One of my favorite stories to tell about that was to tell about one afternoon, I was out with myself, folks from Block by Block and members of Atlanta Code Enforcement, who because of the data had agreed to come out and do walkthroughs in the neighborhood with block by block to review the data that was collected. And at the end of one of those walkthroughs, the code enforcement officer looked at me and she said, you gotta decide whose side you're on. Are you on the side of the university or him? So I stammered him, right? Like it was a cold morning. It was a cold morning in Atlanta, it's like 50. Um, and I'm like, of course I'm on his side. And she says, well, you better be ready for the call. And I said, what call? And she went on to relay this scenario. She said, the call that's gonna happen when you and Les are out collecting this data and you give me a, less, a list of addresses. And I come out and I see that in fact, there's code violations, some of these addresses. And I go and I put stickers on the house and I close them down. And it turns out that one of those houses I closed down belongs to your university president's auntie. And she gets upset. And she calls down to City Hall and he calls down to City Hall. And then I get called in and I'm asked, why did you put a sticker on the president of auntie's house? And I tell them because Carl told me to, right? And then the president calls you, right? You better be ready for that call. What's moving in those kinds of moments is that you realize as an engaged scholar, right? You are being enrolled into a set of politics which you might have supported, but in previous situations, you might have been able to claim that you're outside of. Right? But the institutions, this work of institutioning, as we weave between them, we have to recognize that we ourselves, as both individuals and the institutions we recognize, also become implicated in these practices. Right? We are enrolled into the policies and procedures and the politics of the civics that we are trying to create. We cannot claim to be outside of them. We are in fact part of them. And this calls into question many of the kinds of common discourses that we use to talk about design. For example, discourses of empathy, which are intentionally structured to place the designer or other kinds of makers outside of the context in which they are making for or with. One of the reasons why we do this work is because I would argue, we see this as a kind of practice of care. That the aim of this work um, is to support different ways of attending to communities. Right? And that one of the ways of characterizing that is as a practice of care. So care has a long history um, in both design and outside, right? and very much the discussion of care that I'm interested in comes from a tradition of feminist care ethics. Um, but there was one phrase in particular that has long stuck with me as the kind of care that's happening in these design experiments in civics, which is care of the possible. This is a phrase that um, Isabel Stanger uses to describe the work of pragmatism and I found it extremely moving and it's something that we use quite a bit to think about 
what are we engaged in when we are engaged in these design experiments in civics? And I would argue that what we're engaged in this idea of the care of the possible, right? That the work of the design experiment is to nurture and sustain the possibilities that our civics might be otherwise. That that's the work that we are engaged in. And this happens in many ways, but two that I want to talk about in some detail um, over the next 10 minutes. One way that care of the possible happens is through inventive problem making. And here I'm drawing on the work of Miriam Frazier. So oftentimes it's a common place that we think that experiments solve problems. But in fact, if we look deeply, what we realize is that experiments cause problems, right? The point of the experiment is not to try to necessarily remedy something, or if we want inquiry, it's not to necessarily remedy or resolve something. But when we conduct inquiry, it raises other issues. Right? And in that way, we can think of inventive problem making as a kind of care of possibilities. And in doing so, it does an important work of shifting us away from the heroics of design and shifting us into a different position with regards to solutions. Right? When we create these sorts of maps, Right? whether it's the representation or the data that underlies it. Right? The point is not that we are going to resolve the conditions that are marked on these maps. Right? The point is not that we are going to fix the situation of molded houses or collapsed roofs or rat infestations. We cannot fix these sorts of situations. Right? We cannot fix the kind of situation that you see here, which is a house that has been newly built in a absolutely horrendous and inappropriate architectural style, um, and then left empty right, for so long that you have three foot high weeds growing in the front yard. We cannot fix this situation of gentrification and the kind of systemic racism um, that underlies it. But what we can do, and what the work of the design experiment is to do as a practice of care, is to think about what are the steps that we can take so that that problem might be addressable by others? And this is what I mean by inventive problem making. In careful coding, quite literally, one of the things that we are doing is trying to articulate problems in such a way that they become tractable to others. We are not trying to solve the problem in that neighborhood. That would be grossly inappropriate. What we are trying to do is to work together with the residents to articulate the problems in ways that those who can solve them, right, which are importantly not designers, right, that the problem is made relevant and of interest to them in a way such that they can address it. Right? And so in this idea of inventive problem making is care, right, our work is to nurture these possibilities, to make these problems not relevant to design, not to take on a solutionist approach, from within design, but to realize that others need to address that. And so in this idea right, of, of different narratives and theories, one of the things this does is changes the ways in which we think about the role of design in relationship to action and realizing that in an event of problem making, it directs our attention elsewhere. The second way is through tinkering. Right? And tinkering becomes a practice of care of the possible um, and changes the way we think about design because unlike so much of design discourse, tinkering doesn't really have an end. And tinkering doesn't have the same sort of approach to thinking about um, creation right, that we often hear within design. And so in the project's careful coding, we were constantly involved in tinkering, tinkering with different formats, for example, for collecting data. So we're tinkering with paper-based formats, we're tinkering with the media-based formats and photographs and media browsers, right? We're tinkering constantly with the data and how the data is structured and organized. What's crucial to argue here is that this tinkering is not prototyping. Right? We're not moving towards some end in which we will have finally figured out the right way to do this. And we're not doing that because the conditions of civics are not stable. Right? We're constantly, the neighborhood is constantly having to change its tactics 
because the structures and strategies of the city are changing. And because of that, there is no fixed and final product or service that we are somehow working towards. We are instead constantly changing and trying to adjust our strategies or rather our tactics in the moment. Tinkering in this way becomes a kind of care of the possible and that the work becomes about how do we consistently and definitely try to make things a little bit better where the very definition of what a little bit better is, is contested, never settled, right? One outcome of tinkering that again is a challenge for the definitiveness that often accompanies design is that all tinkering begets is more tinkering. When we take this idea seriously, it never ends. Right? We're constantly fidgeting in order to try to make these situations better. But care is complicated, right? So I don't wanna simply stand up here and say, if we take a care approach, right, everything will be fine because everything won't be fine. And I think that's one of the things that we wanna, I wanna to touch on in the last few minutes is to recognize that part of adopting this kind of approach to work is recognizing what the complications are. So for example, Joan Tronto has talked about the ways in which care oftentimes leads to paternalism and parochialism, two qualities that often characterize design and various kinds of making. Right? And Michelle Murphy has talked about care sometimes can lead us to an uncritical embrace of a positive feeling. Care is not a panacea. And what's important to recognize is that care is not a feel good moment. Right? If we are going to engage in this kind of work of democratic inquiry, if we're going to engage in this kind of work of design experiments and civics, it means recognizing that care is not going to bring a smile to our face. Because just as often, sometimes things happen and then things stop happening, right? New mayor takes office, code enforcement officer that was assigned to the neighborhood retires, right? the Super Bowl comes to town and suddenly the city cleans up everything for a week. Right? All of this is wrapped up in um, politics that are complicated. Right? Code enforcement is run out of the police department, right? The police department, other parts of the police department have a very complicated relationship with this neighborhood, right? Care doesn't get us out of these things. In fact, it puts us into the thick of these things. So we continue to collect this data and we continue to put the data into maps and we continue to structure the data in all sorts of ways. And maybe something happens and maybe something doesn't. Right? And even when something doesn't, it doesn't mean that we can stop doing the work, right? So all of this work happens and still gentrification continues seemingly unabated. So why do this? We do this ultimately actually because of a commitment to democracy itself, right? A commitment that's not going to be found in any other thing that in some ways it's almost a first principles commitment that this is the work of democracy that the work of democracy is fraught and that it is worthwhile to do and to recognize that that is not going to be a feel good moment. Which leads me to my last point, which is what we need to be thinking about then are what are the other subjectivities and affects that we should be talking about, that we should be engaging, that we should be developing, whether we're scholars or practitioners or some combination. So rather than thinking about the designer as hero, what about the role of the more humble maker? Rather than thinking about the champion of innovation, what about the person who accompanies others as they struggle? Rather than thinking about moving fast and breaking things, instead thinking about being the kind of maker who slows things down. And to recognize that all of these experiments have no destiny, right? They don't necessarily result in some kind of preferred outcome. <laughs> One of the things that has been particularly important to me to think about and that I've held on to is the question of what it means to endure. And here I draw upon the work of Elizabeth Pavanelli and, and her um, work with indigenous communities in Australia, where she points out that to say that this community is going to thrive um, would be to put a perspective on this community that might make us feel good as scholars or as media practitioners, but in fact, it's disrespectful, right? That instead, the thing to think about is what does it mean to endure in the face of the difficulties, right? 
um, of democracy? And how do we endure together? And to me, this has become a question that's very important in working with this neighborhood and working with this community, because this community is a community that's stuck in this moment and this question about how to endure. You are not gonna stop what is coming behind that stadium and downtown, right? That idea, right, that gentrification is going to progress. Our responsibility as engaged scholars is to ask how do we enable the community to endure? How do we work together with them as they strive to endure? How do we take that on in a humble sort of way and ask what does it mean to endure together? So with that, I just wanna acknowledge that this work is not my own. Um, I've done this with about a dozen or so people who are still to this day involved in these kinds of things as ongoing practices. And I'm going to end it there and say, thank you and let's talk. Hello, excellent, thank you, Carl. Put this down. Okay, so we're going to attempt this somewhat tentacular, <laughs> me monitoring the chat, Nazia monitoring the chat, and myself also monitoring the room. Are there any questions from the room? Are there any questions in the chat? <laughs> Oh, Vincent has a question. I also do, but you, you go first. Sure. I think this still works. It's, yeah. a, okay, it's, a, it's a kind of a very short question to begin with and to warm up the room maybe. Did, did you receive the call? Um, I have not received the call. Um, that's a great question. I have not received the call. Uh, and we have a new president now of our university. So um, yeah, hopefully he would be kinder if uh, the call came through. Uh, but I mean, I think that we, we have, um, there are aspects of this work. Well, we haven't received that call. You, you know, universities are also real estate companies, right? Um, and so we have occasionally been invited to meetings with the real estate company within the university um, because they hear that we do community engagement and they're thinking that somehow we will sort of um, make it easier for them to build an apartment complex or something. Um, and then they tend to be sorely disappointed that they've invited us. So we get other calls, but we haven't gotten that call. My question actually follows from that quite nicely. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I suppose I was wondering if you could speak to a potential tension that I see and I encounter in my own work in making visible. Um, I guess I, I was thinking that, you know, even design work uh, and specifically, I guess, data collection conducted with care, yeah. <laughs> driven by community in yeah. these participatory action yeah. or community action modes, could still, those data could still be appropriated. Um, my senses written into proprietary algorithms that are used for real estate purposes or insurance yeah. purposes against those very communities. So, so that attention and making visible and sort of connected to that. Um, is there also maybe some work to be done to push against those, you said the, you have to work the data in a way that makes it legible, right? For city hall, why, why doesn't a, a community experience matter in the same way? Or why doesn't a lived experience? So is there some kind of work to be done to push against? I mean, you put it, you said your work um, is experimentation with different configurations of authority. Yeah. But what about con normative conceptions of data or what counts as politically legible? Is that something you also are experimenting with? Yeah, so I think there's two, two questions there. Um, so no, no, I just want to be clear. So I think the first one, yeah, and, and I didn't talk about this today, but there is an aspect of this work that is, that is also about hiding data, right? So um, in that same encounter, I, I, uh, I, I talked about the, the code enforcement officer, um, we were saying, do you want all the data that we collect? And she said, uh, she had this great phrase. She said, don't send me data if you don't want me to act on it. If you put it on my plate, I've got to serve it, right? And 
And what she meant by that was that actually as a city employee, if we send in a violation and it turns out to be accurate, she does have to act on it. The neighborhood doesn't want to send in all the violations because imagine that you have a car in your yard that's up on blocks, right? Um, so the wheels have been taken off and that's, that's a code violation, right? If that car is there because the landlord is letting people store cars in the front yard, they want to report that. If that car is there, or if the grass is over three feet high, because the person who lives there is infirm, right? And they can't take care of their yard anymore, or they can't move the car, they don't want to send that in. Um, because they don't want that person to get caught in that cycle of citation. So in fact, there is in um, one of the tools that's designed, it's a very simple feature, as they collect the data and they sort through the data in the spreadsheets, um, they're able to just use a checkbox to determine which data does and doesn't get shared with the city, right? Yeah, and it's very much so, it, and, and then there's this, okay, we're not gonna put, we're not gonna give them this address because we actually know who lives there and we know what's going on. Instead, we're gonna organize the church youth group to do a cleanup on Sunday, right? So there very much is a discussion about what data does and doesn't get shared. I think the other question is, is really important and it comes up and um, one, we are pushing against that, right? So the idea of the photographic data is not something that normally happens, right? And so this is a way of charting that information over, it's also become a way of charting that information over time because many of those lots that were photographed two, three years ago um, as overgrown now have large, you know, $500,000 plus houses on them, right? So it becomes a kind of evidence that didn't exist before um, that, that the neighborhood is able to use as markers of gentrification. Um, and, and the thing is, is the data isn't, the data doesn't speak by itself. So I could have talked about this more too, I should have. When the community goes and presents the data, they are amazing rhetoricians, right? And they are coming from a history of um, the way in which civil rights claims are made, which involve people who are good at getting up in front of a room and speaking, right? And the data, in fact, is a, is a bit of evidence that adds to that. Um, but in large part, it's not data alone. It is um, the rhetorical force of those community members who know how to work a politician. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, no data ever speak for themselves. Right. <laughs> um, but I guess I wondered if there's some politics, you know, in the reading of certain kinds of data, right? That that, that testimonial evidence may not be weighted the same way mm -hmm. in codified settings like City Hall. Anyway, mm -hmm. excellent work. Okay, online, are there questions? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So we've got a question here from Abhishek. His question is, um, you mentioned the somewhat uneasy relationship between code enforcement being part of the police department and the neighborhood. Does your work expand the resources given to carceral modes of government possibly taking away resources from other civic organizations? Um, it does not, uh, well, let me answer that question two ways. Those modes of government, I believe, are so pervasive um, that I wouldn't want to say that the work we're doing wouldn't ever contribute to that. Um, what I would say is that the data that is being collected and the way it's being collected is directed at bringing, bringing justice to bear on those folks who are exploiting the residents, right? So absentee and delinquent landlords, land development companies, um, predatory lenders not in, in, intentionally not on individual residents themselves. So I'll give you an example. There's another thing that data is never collected on, um, which is squatters, right? So there's a lot of squatters in the neighborhood. Um, 
the folks from block by block know where the squatters are. Squatters are, in fact, a code violation. Squattering data is never collected because there's a sense that people squat because they don't have access to homes, and this is not data that wants to be shared. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Um, um, thank you. So we do have another question as well, somewhat similar, but here it is. Um, universities, businesses, and the city administration usually have different players and interests. In your research experience, have you come across amb ambiguities or contradictions with those stakeholders that brought up tensions in your design work with residents? Um, and if so, how did you deal with them? Yeah, so not so much in this project. We did another project that was um, on determining the um, area media income, right? So this is going to take a minute to explain. Area media income is a statistic that's used to determine who qualifies for affordable housing um, uh, support in a neighborhood. Um, and there was a huge uh, discrepancy between um, actually even within city government about how that number was figured out because um, the process for figuring out that number determines who lives in a neighborhood um, and what rent, what level rent um, can be set by a property development agency. And, you know, without a doubt, the folks in the city who are there to support um, income and tax revenue are interested in setting that number as high as possible, right? Whereas the city council person for that neighborhood maybe wanted to set that number lower so that it actually benefits the neighborhood. I think our approach in this is, um, has always been, always is to support the neighborhood residents. And there it's a matter of saying like, okay, how can, how can we accompany them as they make the claims that they believe are important to them? But I would say that there's a, there's a constant, I think, tension between residents um, and then also between residents of different neighborhoods and, and, and within City Hall to recognize that City Hall is, is itself super heterogeneous. And so one office in City Hall is gonna have one set of concerns and another office is gonna have another set of concerns. Um, and I think it, and from the university perspective, yeah, the university has a, has a position too. I think we have made it clear that our position as researchers is to say, how can we redistribute the resources of the university back into the community? Um, and so I'm less concerned with what the university's um, official perspective is. Uh, thank you. Um, Kelly, I don't see any more questions in the chat right now, unless there's any in the room. I think we have one question from the room. Let's go to that and then we'll go back to the chat. We've got about four minutes left. I have to tell you, it's so weird because I don't know where to look. I like, do I look at you? <laughs> do I look at Phoebe? Time. Like, who do I look at? Like, what? I like, do I, I can't look at the screen? Okay, <laughs> sorry. So my question is more about how do you prevent the city hall depending eventually on the data you're collecting with the community, which is doing this work for free, really, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um, a super important question. And I wrestle with this in the book. And, and I think, you know, one, one critique that often gets leveled is like, oh, this is great, Carl, but really all you're doing is you're contributing to this like growth of, of sort of the neoliberalism of care, right? Um, I'm not denying that that's a real possibility, right? Um, where I have come down personally as a researcher, is that um, the residents want this and they need it and the city's not doing it, right? And so, and given the structure of government, right? Um, the city's not gonna do it soon, right? And so, again, we, we really ask this question, like how do we accompany our partners? And this is what's important for our partners, not that broader conversation. Um, so it's, it's, it's messy. I mean, we are in fact doing work that the city should do, right? Without a doubt. Um, and if we don't do it, or if they don't do it, the city's not gonna suddenly provide resources for doing it. Nazia, is there one last question from the chat? 
Um, I don't see any right now. If anybody's feeling shy, here's your chance. Um, Time for one last question. Is there a question, Masha? Thank you, Carl. Um, I wanted to ask if you um, could bring it back to the context of the smart Atlanta. Um, oh, yeah. You know, that, that whole story and, and to what extent you even potentially see a, a space for dialogue with, with the people that are, um, you know, advocating for that? Yeah, so I think we, we, we do have a strong dialogue for that. And maybe this also gets at your question too about, um, I mean, one of the things that we do with this work is that we're constantly showing up in conversations, whether they are happening at Georgia Tech or they're happening in City Hall that are about shaping the smart city or like, you know, at one point in time, there was this ridiculous discussion about we're going to create a lake of data um, and everyone's going to be able to come and swim in the lake. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, and we're like, okay, well, we want this data in the lake, right? Like this is data that's being collected. Um, how do you make sure that this is being included to the extent that they want to include it, right? And so I think it's really important to provide these material counter examples, right? Because when you show up, right? When a resident shows up and says, I have 300 code violations, right? That you don't have, right? That is materially important to the city and very difficult to ignore, right? Um, and so um, I can theorize how the city is failing as a democracy. Um, and they will say, that's great, Carl, whatever. Um, but when that resident shows up or that resident shows up and says like, hey, we know you have a map. Here's a map that we have, right? Um, and by the way, our map has data your map doesn't have, right? That, that forces a, a recognition of um, what's happening and what's not happening. And, and I'm of the belief um, that it is valuable to continually do that because what you're doing is you're not letting the, the situation settle, right? Like you're constantly saying, yes, but here's this other way that this world of, of a local democracy is being made and you can't um, ignore it. So yeah, we've had conversations. We've had conversations, for example, with 311 about how to change the way in which they accept data um, based upon the kinds of data collection that the residents have done. I think that's great. And gets back to my question in a nice way, um, data contestation. I yeah. Like that. Um, well, I think that's all we have time for before our very first panel. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. DeSalvo.